After finishing the last Bond movie, I wanted to try and find something that I've never done before. And I kept reading scripts and there was nothing that I wanted to do. And eventually my agent and Pippa, who's producing this movie, said, why don't you just write your own script? And I made a lot of fuss about, oh, I don't write, you know. They said, just, just try. This film is very much Sam's passion project. It's a thing that he had in his mind for a number of years and was just looking for a way to get the chance to make it. The idea for the movie came from when I was a very small kid. My grandfather fought in the First World War. His name was Alfred Hubert Mendez, and he went to war in 1917. He was a messenger on the front lines, and he was given the job of carrying the message from post to post. And I started with this fragment, really. Cut. Very good. Blake, pick a man, bring your kit. The movie's based around the journey of two men, and I wanted the audience to have a relatively new experience with those men. I wanted to feel that they didn't know them. And it's a real luxury to be able to make a movie on this scale with two actors who really are, relatively speaking, new to the game. George Mackay and Dean Charles Chapman, who are playing Schofield and Blake, both of them are extraordinary young actors. George embodies some of the qualities that I was looking for. There's something about him that's slightly old-fashioned and internal. And then Dean Charles Chapman, who plays Blake, is a wonderful, instinctive actor. It must be something big if the general's here. You have a brother in the 2nd Battalion. Yes, sir. They're walking into a trap. Your orders are to deliver a message calling off tomorrow morning's attack. Fundamentally, it's a very simple story. Two men have about eight hours to get from one part of the Western Front to another. Action! You've got to cross into enemy territory on a race against time to deliver a message that will save 1,600 lives. Let's talk about this for a minute. Why? If we're not clever about this, no one will get to your brother. I oh, will. Blake is the heart of the film. It's Blake's love for his brother which accelerates the story and gets them moving. <gasps> Come on! In many ways, the movie's about that friendship and what happens to it. They help each other, but in ways they don't really fully comprehend. If you don't get there in time, it will be a massacre. Good luck. From the very beginning, I felt this movie should be told in real time. Every step of the journey, breathing every breath with these men, felt integral. And there is no better way to tell this story than with one continuous shot. From the first moment I talked to Sam about the idea of it as a one-shot movie, I knew it was going to be really immersive. Stay low. It's meant to make you feel that you are in the trenches with those two young men. And the camera never, ever comes away from the two characters. Sometimes you have a camera being carried by an operator hooked onto a wire, and the wire carries it across more land and it's unhooked again, that operator runs with it, then steps onto a small jeep, which carries him another 400 yards, and he steps off it again and goes round a corner. There's always that sort of get out of jail card that you have with the movie. Well, you know, we might be able to cut around this, or we might take that scene out. That's not possible on this film. The dance of the camera and the mechanics all have to be in sync with what the actor's doing. It's like a piece of theater every take. Once it starts, it can't stop. If something goes wrong, you just have to keep going. And there were so many scenes that I just completely got lost in. I'm sorry! Royal Commission. Send me through. Orders from the general. Sometimes a scene was six minutes long, and when they'd call cut, I would completely forget who I was, and I was Blake. If you told it in a conventional way, I don't think you would have felt the energy you're always moving forward. You never go back. And the planning was absolutely key. The challenges of prepping this movie are the challenges of prepping a normal movie times about five. 
we had to measure every step of the journey. In the early days of rehearsing, me and Joel, Sam and Roger turned up to this open field that was pretty much nothing there other than grass. And we had the script in our hand and we literally just walked and talked every single scene to see how long it took us to get from A to B. The scene has to be the exact length of the land and the land cannot be longer than the scene and the scene cannot be longer than the land. And so you have to rehearse every line of dialogue on location. And that's where it overlaps with doing theatre, because the world has to be crafted around the rhythm of the script. We had a lot of group conversations about the sets, whether it was over models or illustrations that Dennis had done. We wanted to understand the physicality of what we had to build. We built over a mile of trenches. To dig it was quite a task. When we were digging, we were still doing rehearsals. We were still staking out the trench lengths so that we could hone in the exact distances that we needed. You almost have to change the way you think about how we view movies as a viewer and how we make movies as a filmmaker. The art department, more than anyone, has been really affected just figuring out the scale of how large these sets need to be. It's a highly choreographed piece. So every inch has to be accounted for. It was an amazing amount of work. Every place that we went was a magnitude of problems to solve. You have all these locations that are basically just ground, and you have to create something out of it. Roger and Dennis had to work together to figure out a set that could incorporate where the camera needed to be making sure it felt natural and organic within the scene. With the timeline and the picking clock, when you start the film, there's no turning back. And the myriads of problems that come up, everything will hit you and everything did hit us in order to create the spaces that we did. Let's go back to one. This film does not take place in a series of interiors. This is endless exteriors. No location ever repeats, so you're constantly moving through landscapes. Being such an exterior movie, we're very dependent on the light and the weather. And we kind of realize, well, for a start, you can't really light it. Action. Because, you know, if you were running down a trench and turning around 360 degrees, there's nowhere to put a light anywhere. And because we were shooting in story order, we have to shoot in cloud to get the continuity from scene to scene. So some mornings, the sun would be out and we couldn't shoot. So we would rehearse. And uh, we're rehearsing. And then we'd be waiting around everyone with their eyes up in the sky, trying to see how long it'd take for the sun to move behind the cloud. And as soon as it comes over, you've got this five minute window. Everyone would be like, come on, go, go, go. Go, go, go! So you are also in the lap of the gods. One of the key elements in realizing this film has been Roger Deakins' input. From the very early days, Roger was right by Sam's side, working out exactly what it was that Sam was looking for. Any time I shoot a film, I want to put the audience in this world, whether it's a fantasy world or a real world like 1917. There's a scene where they had all these flares going up over the top of the town, and those flares were lighting the whole scene. So we needed to figure out how much time the flares needed to be in the air to get the look we were after. They had this model where they were testing which way the shadows moved. What was key was the way the light fell through the windows to create the shadow and the layers of light. It almost feels like the ground beneath his feet is moving because the light is moving. There's something nightmarish about it and strange. What Roger Deakins has done with this film is amazing. Some of the camera work just blew my mind. Roger is always so inventive. It was like no other form of filmmaking that I've ever experienced before. You have to construct a journey for the camera that's every bit as interesting as the journey of the actor. What I wanted was one ribbon, like a snake, moving forward, in which the information that you needed happened to fall in front of where the camera was pointing. 
the fact that we're moving always forward, it does have a compound effect, a gradual growing menace. And that constant sense of threat of what isn't seen, of what might be around the corner, is baked into the DNA of this movie. There is only one way this war ends. Last man standing. It's really important that we don't forget the people who fought in the First World War. There's a duty to remember them and remember what they did. The things that these soldiers go through are horrendous. It's intimate in a way that I don't think any other war movie I've seen is. Until you actually see it on a screen, you don't really realize how immersive it is and how that technique kind of draws you into it. For me, engagement is very important, and that is behind the way in which we've decided to shoot this film. At the end of the day, you just hope you made something special that people feel personally about. When you achieve that, it's really beautiful and exhilarating.